The man known to history as Leonid Brezhnev was born on the 19th of December 1906 in the town of Kamenskoy in Ukraine, then part of the Russian Empire. His father was Ilya Brezhnev, a factory worker who moved to Kamenskoy in 1894 from a village in the Kursk region in southwestern Russia. At the time of Leonid's birth, Kamenskoy would have had a population of around 50,000 people and the local economy was dominated by an ironworks and railway track factory operated by the South Russia Company. The rapid growth in the town's population during Brezhnev's childhood reflected the fast-paced industrialization of the Imperial Russian economy, which began in the late 19th century. Ilya started working at the rolling mill factory, part of the ironworks, in 1900, where working conditions were poor. Ilya worked 12 hours each day, but despite the increasing influence of socialist ideas among workers in Russian factories demanding better pay and conditions, he was not particularly interested in revolution and preferred to climb the social ladder through hard work. Leonid's mother, Natalia Mazalova, was the daughter of Denis Mazalov, who had moved to Kamenskoy from Yenakievo, near the city of Yuzovka, modern-day Donetsk, in eastern Ukraine. Accordingly, Leonid Brezhnev was half Russian and half Ukrainian, resulting in his ethnicity being given as Ukrainian in some documents and Russian in others. Natalia Brezhneva met her husband Ilya while she was bringing lunch to her father at the rolling mill, where the two men worked, and after their marriage in 1901, the couple had four children. Their first child, a daughter named Fioktista, was born in 1905 but died immediately. The birth of Leonid in 1906 was followed by daughter Vera in 1910 and son Yakov in 1912. Leonid Brezhnev was born in a single room rented by his parents and maternal grandparents from a furnace master in Kamenskoy, and in 1910 the family moved into their own rented flat. With Ilya away at work for most of the day, Natalia managed the household. During his childhood, Leonid was an active boy who enjoyed swimming in the river Dnieper and playing football, which at the time was considered a working-class sport. Details of Brezhnev's early education are limited, but in 1915 he enrolled in the local grammar school, where he studied Latin, German, French, Russian literature, history, biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics, geography and art. Leonid's parents hoped that he would become an engineer, and a respected member of the middle class. But the Russian Revolution of 1917 disrupted the comfortable existence the Brezhnevs had aspired to. Since 1914, the Russian Empire had been fighting against Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire in the First World War. After some early setbacks, by 1916, the Russian army was performing more effectively on the field. But the imperial government struggled to deal with the economic crisis that was engulfing the country as prices of food and fuel skyrocketed in the cities. A series of workers' demonstrations in early March 1917 forced Tsar Nicholas II to abdicate from the throne, and political power in the capital of Petrograd was inherited by the Liberal Provisional Government and the Socialist Petrograd Soviet of Workers' and Soldiers' Deputies. After a failed military offensive in the summer, the Provisional Government struggled to assert its authority and faced pressure from both left and right. This period saw an increase in support for Vladimir Lenin's Communist Bolshevik Party. The Bolsheviks were Marxists, who supported a workers' revolution to overthrow the government and build socialism through a communist government by taking control of the economy for the benefit of the workers while eliminating social divisions. After building socialism, the Marxists believed that the state could gradually disappear, leading to a society which valued social equality and individual freedom. In the summer of 1917, the Bolsheviks were the only major political party to demand an end to the war. And in early November, the Bolsheviks seized power on behalf, in their view, of the people in what was known as the October Revolution. Since Imperial Russia continued to use the Julian calendar, which was 12 days behind the Gregorian calendar. Soon after taking power, the Bolsheviks changed their official party name to the Communist Party and moved the capital from Petrograd to Moscow. In March 1918, the Bolsheviks signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk 
with Germany, agreeing to hand over large parts of the former empire, including Belarus and Ukraine. In June 1917, the Ukrainian People's Republic declared independence from Russia, but by the end of the year, the Bolsheviks took over the government in Kiev, sacking Kamenskoy in the process. Over the next three years, the town changed hands over 20 times, as competing factions vied for control of Ukraine in the Russian Civil War. After the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, the Germans established a right-wing government known as the Hetmanate until Germany's defeat in the First World War in November 1918. In 1919, Kamenskoy was occupied in turn by the Cuban Cossacks. General Anton Denikin of the anti-Bolshevik White Army and the Ukrainian anarchist Nestor Makhno's Green Army, before the Bolshevik Red Army finally established control. Under the Bolsheviks, the school Leonid attended was renamed the First Workers' School, and many of his former teachers lost their lives during the constant political upheavals. After surviving the typhus epidemic in early 1921, the 14-year-old Brezhnev left school that summer. The factory in Kamenskoy had stopped production in 1919, and in 1921, Ilya Brezhnev decided to take his family back to his native village near Kursk. For the next two years, Leonid may have worked as a porter to help his family survive. During the Russian Civil War, the Bolsheviks seized control of the rural economy and requisitioned grain to feed its army and the cities. But in 1922, Lenin introduced his new economic policy, which reinstated a limited market economy in the countryside improving economic conditions in the country. That same year, the Socialist Republics of Russia, Ukraine, Belarus and the Caucasian states of Armenia, Georgia and Azerbaijan formed the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the Soviet Union. In 1923, Brezhnev enrolled in the Technical College of Land Management in Kursk to study agriculture. He later claimed to an aide that he financed his studies by working as an extra at the local theatre where he developed a talent for acting and an interest in poetry. His favourite poet was Sergei Yezinin, and he also attended a reading by the revolutionary poet Vladimir Mayakovsky in Kursk. Brezhnev wrote revolutionary poetry of his own, and in 1923 he joined the Komsomol, the Bolshevik youth organisation. His support for the Bolsheviks seems to have been rooted in his desire for social advancement, and he was not part of the wave of Komsomol members who joined the party on Lenin's death in 1924. In 1925, he met Victoria Denisova, a student at the Technical College of Medicine, whom he married in March 1928. The couple had two children, a daughter named Galina in 1929, and a son, Yuri, born in 1933. Brezhnev graduated from college in May 1927 and became a land manager in Kursk Oblast or province. But after a year, he and his new wife moved to the Urals, near the city of Sverlovsk, the former and future Ekaterinburg. The start of Brezhnev's career coincided with radical changes in agricultural policy, introduced by the Communist Party leadership in Moscow. The Communist Party had agreed to a system of collective leadership after Lenin's death, but the leaders disagreed about whether to keep the new economic policy or to impose state control over agriculture and continue the work of building a true communist state. By 1927, General Secretary Joseph Stalin and his ally Nikolai Bukharin had outmaneuvered their rivals by supporting the new economic policy. By controlling the Communist Party apparatus, Stalin had become the most powerful leader in the Soviet Union. In December 1927, Stalin abruptly changed course and abolished the new economic policy by launching his campaign to collectivize Soviet agriculture. Alongside industrialization, agricultural collectivization formed a key part of the first five-year plan introduced by Stalin in October 1928. Working in the land registry, Brezhnev was involved in surveying and mapping the land before eliminating the boundaries between individual strips of land and gathering them into agricultural collectives. The reorganization of the Soviet agricultural economy provoked opposition from farmers, especially those with larger plots of land, known as kulaks, who were offered poor quality land often on the edge of fields as compensation. Stalin denounced anyone who opposed collectivization as a kulak and ordered the secret police to carry out collectivization by force, seizing grain and deporting peasants who resisted. 
As he carried out his duties, Brezhnev's political responsibilities increased, and on the 9th of October 1929, he joined the Communist Party as a full member. In February 1930, he was promoted to chair the city of Sverlovsk's land management department, and after spending three years in the fields, he was now behind a desk, arbitrating disputes between the remaining individual farmers and the collective farms. In November 1929, Stalin announced a push for total collectivization, but four months later, he reversed course. Amidst the confusion and the violence of the de campaign, Brezhnev left his post as head of the Sverlovsk Land Registry after only six months in the role. In September 1930, Brezhnev moved to Moscow to study at the Kalinin Institute of Agricultural Machinery, but abandoned his studies after two months and returned to his parents' house in Kamenskoy. By 1931, he was working at the ironworks, now renamed in honor of the late Felix Derzinski, the Polish founder of the Soviet secret police, who helped to reopen the closed factory in 1925. After finishing work at the factory, Brezhnev spent the evenings studying at the affiliated Arsinichev Institute of Metallurgy, becoming secretary of the Institute's party organization by March 1932. He was involved in the party's campaign to requisition grain from Ukrainian peasants resisting collectivization, leading to famine in Ukraine itself. The following March, he became director of the Workers' Faculty, an educational institution that prepared workers for higher education, and in January 1935, he graduated from the Arsenichev Institute as a thermal power engineer. After less than a year working as an engineer in the Derzinski plant, in October 1935, Brezhnev was drafted into the army and spent a year in Chita in Siberia, where he soon became the political head of a tank division. By the time he returned home in November 1936, the city was renamed Dnipro Zerzinsk, in honor of Zerzinsky and the Dnipro River. In Moscow, Stalin was beginning his Great Purge, led by the secret police, now known as the NKVD eliminating his former leadership rivals from the 1920s, whom he accused of being traitors to the communist cause. As Stalin warned against internal enemies within the party, Brezhnev was appointed director of the dnipro Zinkt Technical College of Metallurgy. Though Brezhnev expected to continue his career in industry and wasn't an enthusiastic communist, the purges offered young party officials the opportunity to quickly rise through the ranks, while subjecting them to the risk of being purged themselves. By 1937, the purges had shifted to target Ukraine, and of the 15,000 employees in the Zerzinski metalworks, over 700 were shot. While a succession of city party leaders were removed and shot in 1937, Brezhnev was unscathed and became deputy chairman of the dnipro Zerzinsk City Soviet, making him deputy mayor responsible for construction and public works. As the arrests, expulsions and executions continued, Brezhnev did not have any decision-making responsibility, but nevertheless, he voted to condemn officials who had been his benefactors and friends to ensure his own survival. In January 1938, Stalin's ally Nikita Khrushchev was appointed first secretary of the Ukrainian Communist Party and served in the post for over a decade. A new clique of Ukrainian party leaders emerged under Khrushchev's protection, and in May 1938, Brezhnev moved to the provincial capital of Dnipro-Petrovsk, now known by its Ukrainian name of Dnipro, where he would lead the Department of Trade. The following February, Brezhnev was made propaganda secretary, owing his promotion to Konstantin Grushevoy, a college friend from the Metallurgical Institute who had become deputy head of the Oblast Party. Brezhnev managed a team of 80 propagandists, supporting Stalin's campaign to eliminate the remnants of Ukrainian nationalism and promote the use of the Russian language in schools and newspapers. The department's work also involved spreading the party's message on foreign affairs. For most of 1939, it seemed that the Soviet Union was about to go to war with Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany, and Brezhnev dutifully denounced Hitler. In late August 1939, after the Nazis and Soviets signed a non-aggression pact before invading Poland to start the Second World War, Brezhnev's propaganda machine immediately reversed course and began to praise the German leader. Although Stalin had made a deal with Hitler, he believed that it would only delay war between the Soviet Union and Germany and aimed to rebuild the Soviet Union's military capacity 
so that it could compete with Germany on equal terms. In September 1940, Brezhnev was promoted to third secretary of the Oblast Party Committee and was given responsibility for armaments. Dnipro-Petrovsk Oblast produced 16% of the country's steel and it was Brezhnev's job to adapt the factories for military production. On the 22nd of June 1941, Hitler launched his invasion of the Soviet Union earlier than Stalin had anticipated, beginning a phase in the Second World War which the Soviets called the Great Patriotic War. Immediately after the invasion, Brezhnev and the provincial party leadership attempted to mobilize reinforcements from the army and continue military production in the factories. But a couple of weeks later, as the German military juggernaut moved eastwards and overcame Soviet defenses, an order came through to dismantle and evacuate the factories. Brezhnev joined the army on the 14th of July and was ordered to lead the evacuation of Dnipro-Petrovsk. When the Germans captured the city on the 25th of August, Brezhnev remained with the military and political leadership and was among the last to leave. Brezhnev worked as a political commissar at the Southern Front, a task which involved informing soldiers of the ideological meaning of the war and inspiring morale at the front line. The role did not involve any military combat, and Brezhnev spent much of his time organizing supplies for the men behind the front lines. In November 1941, the Soviets recaptured the city of Rostov-on-Don, but a counteroffensive to retake the then Ukrainian capital of Kharkov in early 1942 proved a disaster, allowing the Germans to strike back and advance as far as Stalingrad on the banks of the Volga River in an attempt to seize the oil fields of the Caucasus. In August 1942, Brezhnev became deputy head of the political administration of the Transcaucasian Front, but the following April he was demoted to head of the 18th Army's political department with the military rank of colonel. In early 1943, while the Soviet armies bogged down the German offensive at Stalingrad, Brezhnev accompanied the 18th Army as it advanced on the Black Sea port of Novorossiysk where, in September, he was wounded when his landing craft hit a mine. As the victorious Soviet armies advanced westward, the 18th Army was reassigned to the 1st Ukrainian Front, which retook Kyiv in November. In August 1944, the 18th was transferred to the 4th Ukrainian Front, beyond the Carpathian Mountains in western Ukraine, fighting on land that had belonged to Czechoslovakia before the war. After being promoted to Major General, Brezhnev's job was to present the Soviet army as liberators and establish Communist Party institutions in the region to prepare it for annexation by the Soviet Union. In early 1945, Brezhnev joined the 18th Army as it liberated Czechoslovakia alongside the 1st Czechoslovak Army Corps, commanded by Ludvík Svoboda, taking the capital of Prague on the 8th of May 1945 the same day Germany surrendered to the Allied nations of Britain, France, the United States and the Soviet Union. After the war, the Soviet Union incorporated the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Over the next few years, supported by the presence of Soviet armies of occupation, the Central European states of Poland, Czechoslovakia and Hungary came under communist rule, while Germany was split between capitalist West Germany and communist East Germany. After the end of the war, Brezhnev was promoted to Chief of Political Administration of the 4th Ukrainian Front, before going to Moscow, where he participated in the Victory Parade on Red Square on the 24th of June 1945. As he marched across Red Square in his dress uniform, Colonel Leonid Brezhnev was 38 years old, a Communist Party bureaucrat with experience of agricultural and industrial policy, who had been a beneficiary of Stalin's purges and was making his way up the ranks of the Ukrainian party before the Nazi invasion. During the Great Patriotic War, his fortunes reflected those of the Red Army, beginning with despair and defeat and ending in triumph, as he helped to extend the projection of Soviet power westwards into Central Europe. By the time Brezhnev returned to Ukraine in August, the 4th Ukrainian Front was renamed the Carpathian Military District incorporating territories annexed from Czechoslovakia and Romania. There are few accounts of Brezhnev's activities in the year following the war, but he was responsible for fighting Ukrainian nationalist insurgents and imposing the Soviet system of political and economic control on the formerly non-Soviet lands. Brezhnev's work during the war 
caught the attention of Nikita Khrushchev, who secured his transfer from the army back to the Ukrainian Communist Party, where he soon developed a reputation as an effective administrator, implementing Stalin's policies. In September 1946, he was appointed to lead the party organization in the city of Zaporizhia in southeast Ukraine, where he began the process of rebuilding the steelworks and the hydroelectric dam after the destruction during the war. Brezhnev was assisted by Second Secretary Andrei Kirilenko, who had served in the political department of the 18th Army, and by the beginning of March, they managed to get one of the turbines of the hydroelectric plant running. The devastation of the war led to another famine in Ukraine, which Stalin once again blamed on enemies of the state. Brezhnev attempted to rein in the agitation and concentrated on finding practical solutions to the problems. In March, Khrushchev was removed as leader of the Ukrainian party, and the demotion of his patron threatened Brezhnev's own survival. Brezhnev focused on fulfilling Stalin's ambitious reconstruction objectives, and after the steel plant returned to operation in October 1947, he was awarded the Order of Lenin by Stalin in December. And before the year was out, Khrushchev had been reappointed first secretary in Ukraine. In November 1947, Brezhnev was transferred to take over the party leadership at Dnipropetrovsk in order to manage the reconstruction work on the damaged city and encourage agricultural production. During these years, he built up a network of political associates nicknamed the Dnipropetrovsk Mafia, who would remain loyal supporters as Brezhnev rose up the party ranks in the ensuing decades. Members of this group included Nikolai Tikhonov, the chief engineer of the Lenin metallurgical plant, Vladimir Semichastny, who led the Komsomol in Kyiv, and Vladimir Sherbitsky, the party's deputy leader in his home city of dnipro zerzinkt who had become one of his closest friends. In recognition for leading the reconstruction of Dnipro-Petrovsk, in January 1949, Brezhnev was elected to the Central Committee of the Ukrainian Communist Party. He continued to receive the favor of Stalin and Khrushchev, and after the latter was appointed party boss in Moscow in December 1949, Brezhnev was given an appointment in Moscow. Not long after, in July 1950, Stalin appointed him first secretary of the Communist Party in Moldavia, modern-day Moldova. Nestled between Soviet Ukraine in the northeast and the independent Socialist Republic of Romania to the southwest, Moldavia had previously been an autonomous republic within Ukraine, but in 1940 it was enlarged by the annexation of the Romanian regions of Bukovina and Bessarabia. It was the poorest of the Soviet republics in Europe and suffered terribly during the post-war famine. As in Ukraine, Stalin responded with repression, and in July 1949, 35,000 people were deported by the NKVD. The crackdown did nothing to improve conditions and prompted Stalin to send Brezhnev to the Moldavian capital of Kishinev. Stalin regarded Brezhnev as a reliable and effective party operative who would implement orders from Moscow without complaint but Brezhnev exercised control of his party colleagues through collective decision-making rather than intimidation and was prepared to give subordinates second chances rather than dismissing them straight away. This approach increased party discipline and motivated his colleagues to take action to meet the ambitious agricultural quotas demanded by Moscow. In order to encourage peasants to join collective farms, he promoted ideological education through propaganda rather than threats or punishments, and by March 1951, he claimed that agricultural collectivization in Moldavia was complete. During his stint in Moldavia, Brezhnev also built a thermal power station and began work on a hydroelectric dam on the Dinesta River. Brezhnev's closest associates in Moldavia were Nikolai Shelikov, whom he brought from Dnipro-Petrovsk to serve as his deputy, and Konstantin Chenenko, the propaganda chief of the Moldavian party who would go on to serve as Brezhnev's right-hand man at the summit of Soviet politics. Faced with ambitious demands from Moscow and criticized by his superiors if he did not achieve them, Brezhnev worked tirelessly and in May 1952 suffered a heart attack at the age of 45. After taking a two-month break from work, he was attacked by delegates at the party plenum in August for failing to deal effectively with nationalists and other ideological opponents, 
and for his lenient treatment of party officials. After this assessment was echoed in the party newspaper Pravda, in September, Brezhnev had an article published in the ideological magazine Bolshevik, defending his approach by quoting Stalin's words on criticism and self-criticism. In October 1952, Brezhnev was in Moscow for the 11th Party Congress, where he met Stalin in person for the first time and was mistaken for being a Moldavian. Brezhnev was not only made a member of the Central Committee, but also became a candidate member of the Party Presidium, formerly the Politburo, which Stalin had expanded to dilute the power of some of the more influential members, whom he suspected of plotting against him. In late 1952, Brezhnev and his family left for Moscow, moving into a three-room apartment in western Moscow, which became his permanent home in the capital. He regularly attended presidium meetings and was asked by Stalin to manage propaganda within the army and the navy. When Stalin died on the 5th of March 1953, membership of the presidium was reduced to its original size of nine members. Brezhnev lost his seat in the country's supreme decision-making body and was demoted to deputy head of the Ministry of Defense's political administration. In the months after Stalin's death, Stalin's secret police chief, Lavrenti Beria, had assumed the leading role. But in late June, Khrushchev and Georgi Melenkov, the chairman of the Council of Ministers, organized a coup to arrest Beria. The operation was led by Marshal Georgi Zhukov, the commander-in-chief of the Soviet armies in the Great Patriotic War, and Brezhnev was among the armed men who subdued Beria. Despite his demotion from the presidium, Brezhnev's relationship with Khrushchev meant that he continued to be close to the center of power, and in August 1953, he was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant General in the Soviet Army. After the ousting of Beria, the Presidium claimed to exercise collective leadership, but as with the years after Lenin's death, this masked a power struggle between Khrushchev, who was appointed first secretary of the Communist Party in September, and Malenkov, who as chairman of the Council of Ministers was state premier and head of government. While Malenkov favored the development of light industry, Khrushchev continued the push for heavy industry and advocated the allocation of more land for arable farming. Accordingly, Khrushchev launched the Virgin Lands Campaign to develop 13 million hectares of previously uncultivated land, much of which was located in Kazakhstan. When the incumbent native Kazakh party leaders were unwilling to implement the program, in January, the Presidium sent a new leadership team to Kazakhstan, with Malenkov's supporter, Pantelimon Ponomarenko, serving as first secretary and Brezhnev as his deputy. After moving to the Kazakh capital of Almaty, Brezhnev faced many of the same challenges that had confronted him in Moldavia. He was working in a poor country which spoke a non-Slavic language and had to introduce Soviet ideology and Russian culture while carrying out his main task of developing an agricultural system which supplied grain, cotton and corn to other parts of the Soviet Union. The main difference was that while Moldavia was a narrow strip of land, Kazakhstan was the size of Western Europe and had a population of 7 million. Despite their competing loyalties, Ponomarenko and Brezhnev worked well together, with the former remaining in the capital and the latter traveling around the country promoting the Virgin Lands campaign. The two men restructured the party organization, but while Ponomarenko exercised authority by making threats to subordinates, Brezhnev maintained his collegial and constructive approach. For 1954 and 1955, Moscow determined that 6.3 million hectares had to be cultivated in Kazakhstan. The center decided how much grain was needed and hence how much land had to be cultivated and it was up to Brezhnev in Kazakhstan to send out surveyors to identify suitable sites for farms. In 1954, 90 state farms were built in convenient locations, close to the railways and rivers, but the following year, the farms expanded into the more remote steppes. When the yield on the farms were lower than expected, Brezhnev blamed the farm directors and party organizers for their treatment of farmers, denying them pay, providing poor living conditions, and failing to adequately supply the farms with drinking water. Despite these setbacks, Khrushchev continued to expand the Virgin Lands program, and in 1955, Brezhnev had to organize 250 new collective farms and accommodate 170,000 farm workers. 
the material aid provided by Moscow in terms of supplies and farm machinery was not enough. The newly arrived workers often had no farming experience and seeds were often sown on unplowed fields. Ponomarenko and Brezhnev attempted to address the problem of low yields by establishing academic institutions to study new planting methods. But despite the unsuitable soil and the inexperienced farmers, Khrushchev insisted on planting corn for livestock feed, and Brezhnev dutifully defended the policy in Kazakhstan, only for drought in the summer of 1955 to threaten the entire 700,000 hectares planted. In the meantime, livestock farms in Kazakhstan struggled due to a shortage of feed, resulting in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of animals in winter. While the failure to keep animals alive put pressure on the leadership of the Kazakh party, Ponomarenko's dismissal as first secretary in May was the result of Khrushchev gaining the upper hand in his power struggle with Melenkov and securing his dismissal as premier in February. With Khrushchev firmly in charge, Brezhnev became first secretary of Kazakhstan in August 1955. In the absence of Ponomarenko, Brezhnev developed a close working relationship with Din Mukhamed Kunyaev, who had been appointed chairman of the Council of Ministers in Kazakhstan in April. In February 1956, Brezhnev travelled to Moscow for the 20th Party Congress, where he returned to the Presidium as a candidate member. At a closed session on the 24th of February, Khrushchev delivered his so-called secret speech, denouncing Stalin for his repressive rule and his mismanagement of the Soviet economy. Although Brezhnev was not known to make long speeches in the Presidium, he supported Khrushchev on most issues. In late 1956, when an uprising broke out in Hungary in support of the reformist communist leader Imre Nagy, Brezhnev was involved in compiling a list of loyal Hungarian officials whom Moscow could rely on. When Soviet tanks suppressed the uprising in early November and Yanos Kadar emerged as Nagy's successor, Brezhnev was one of three presidium members to go to Budapest to deliver Moscow's blessing for the changing government. In 1957, Khrushchev proposed devolving economic decision-making from the government ministries in Moscow to the regions. This encouraged an attempt to depose Khrushchev by his former rival Malenkov. Supported by Stalin's associates, Lazar Kaganovich, former Foreign Minister Vyakashlav Molotov, Marshal Clement Voroshilov, as well as Premier Nikolai Bulganin, who Khrushchev had appointed to succeed Melenkov two years earlier. At a presidium meeting on the 18th of June, seven full Politburo members called for Khrushchev's dismissal. As a candidate member, Brezhnev did not have voting rights, and when he spoke in defense of Khrushchev, he was shouted down by Kaganovich and collapsed unconscious. Though Khrushchev initially believed that Brezhnev faked the illness and wanted to save his own skin, Brezhnev sent Khrushchev a letter the following day assuring him of his support. As the denunciations continued in the Presidium the following day, Central Committee members stormed the meeting and demanded a special plenum, which was convened on the 22nd of June. During the plenum, Brezhnev attacked Kaganovich, Malenkov and Molotov and accused them of complicity in Stalin's terror. Khrushchev survived the coup and Brezhnev became a full member of the Presidium. Among Khrushchev's defenders in June was Marshal Zhukov, but when Khrushchev turned against him in October, Brezhnev joined in the attack, accusing Zhukov of creating a cult of personality. Brezhnev also rallied behind Khrushchev when he dismissed Bulganin as premier in 1958 and took the office himself, combining leadership in the party with the leadership of the government. Brezhnev's loyalty to Khrushchev continued to be rewarded, and in March 1958, he was given responsibility for heavy industry and armaments, including the space program. The space program was a key part of Khrushchev's desire to demonstrate the superiority of Soviet science and technology during the Cold War, as the Soviet Union and the United States found themselves locked in an ideological battle between capitalism and communism for global influence. While in Kazakhstan, Brezhnev had overseen the construction of the rocket launch site at the Baikonur Cosmodrome, and in his new role, he also assumed responsibility for rocket construction. Brezhnev made a good impression during his first meeting with the nuclear physicist Andrei Sakharov, the father of the Soviet hydrogen bomb, and he frequently met with lead rocket engineer Sergei Korolev. While the Soviet space program had its fair share of tragedies during these early days, 
Brezhnev took credit for the launch of satellites and basked in the glow of Yuri Gagarin's spaceflight on the 12th of April 1961. On the 7th of May 1960, Brezhnev was elected chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet, the Soviet Union's rubber stamp legislature. The position made Brezhnev head of state and had previously been regarded as an honorary role for an elder statesman. But unlike his predecessor, Marshal Voroshilov, Brezhnev's prestige was enhanced by being able to represent the Soviet Union abroad, supporting Khrushchev's efforts to seek a peaceful accommodation with the capitalist West, a process known as détente. While Brezhnev had plenty of experience with agriculture, industry and defence, this was the first time he was seriously involved in foreign policy. He supported Khrushchev's vision of promoting the superiority of the Soviet system, making 15 foreign trips between 1961 and 1964. Khrushchev took a greater interest in Africa, offering to work alongside nationalist anti-colonial movements while also reminding the African nations that Russia never had any African colonies. During his first foreign trip in early 1961, Brezhnev visited Morocco, Guinea and Ghana, where he signed trade agreements and called for the withdrawal of French troops from Algeria and the Belgians from Congo. He continued to spread the anti-colonial message in India and Afghanistan, and on a visit to Iran in 1963, he welcomed increased economic cooperation, even as he recognized that the Shah was dependent on the United States. Brezhnev did not neglect fellow communist states in Europe, establishing a close relationship with Marshal Tito in Yugoslavia and appealing to locals by recalling his wartime experiences during a visit to Czechoslovakia. Brezhnev continued to work closely with Khrushchev on the space program and also with him on his efforts to de-Stalinize the Soviet Union. To achieve the latter goal, Brezhnev assisted Khrushchev in his project to rewrite Stalin's 1936 constitution by devolving greater power to the people and introducing term limits for party officials. Within the space of 20 years after the end of the Second World War, Brezhnev had helped to rebuild Ukrainian industry, strengthened Soviet rule in Moldavia, initiated the Virgin Lands program in Ukraine, and contributed to the Soviet Union gaining an early lead over the United States in the space race. By 1964, he was Khrushchev's right-hand man and enjoyed a similar degree of international recognition as the first secretary. However, by 1964, Brezhnev was losing patience with Khrushchev's tendency to transfer party leaders to new posts without prior consultation, undermining his own patronage networks in Ukraine, Moldavia and Kazakhstan. While Khrushchev was developing his own personality cult, Brezhnev and his presidium colleagues were feeling increasingly insecure and were regularly subjected to insults from the first secretary. In July 1964, Khrushchev appointed Anastas Mikoyan to replace Brezhnev, who was demoted to Joint Central Committee Secretary alongside Nikolai Podgorny. Throughout the year, Brezhnev was recruiting plotters to oust Khrushchev, including Ukrainian party boss Pavlo Shelest and secret police chief Vladimir Semichastny. The stakes increased when Khrushchev told the Presidium in September that he would disband it after returning from his holiday with Mikoyan at Pitsunda in Georgia. After securing the support of Defense Minister Marshal Rodion Malinovsky, on the 12th of October, Brezhnev summoned Khrushchev to Moscow for an urgent meeting. After Khrushchev and Mikoyan returned to Moscow on the 13th of October, Brezhnev summoned a meeting of the Presidium where over two days, all the members of the body joined in the denunciations of Khrushchev's cult of personality, his failed economic policies and his party reorganization, which involved splitting the party into separate branches, with responsibility for agriculture and industry respectively. Even Mikoyan admitted that Khrushchev had made mistakes, though he suggested a face-saving arrangement for the first secretary. When he was finally given a chance to respond, Khrushchev conceded defeat and a plenum of the Central Committee that evening endorsed Khrushchev's dismissal. The plenum decided to separate the posts of First Secretary and Premier, with Brezhnev becoming First Secretary and Deputy Premier Alexei Kosygin becoming Premier. Mikoyan remained as Head of State for another year, before being replaced by Podgorny. After assuming control of the party apparatus, Brezhnev placed his ally Dmitry Ustinov in charge of defence with Fyodor Kulakov as Secretary of Agriculture, while responsibility for industry went to his old friend Andrei Kirilenko. 
He hoped to bring his friend Vladimir Sherbitsky to Moscow, but the latter was happy to lead the party organization in Ukraine. The deposed Khrushchev was given a dacha and put under house arrest until his death in 1971. In order to consolidate his power and avoid Khrushchev's fate, Brezhnev led the party by assuring his presidium colleagues that both their lives and their jobs would be secured, and in 1966 he overturned Khrushchev's term limits and rotation of office policy, renaming the presidium the Politburo and his office of first secretary to general secretary. The Politburo members saw the general secretary as their protector, and Brezhnev maintained friendly relations by inviting them to football matches at the CSKA Moscow Stadium and traveling with them to their neighboring dachas in the Crimea. Brezhnev used social events not only to encourage a sense of camaraderie, but also to assert his dominance among the all-male Politburo. He enjoyed hunting at Zavidovo to the west of Moscow and proved to be the best shot among his Politburo colleagues until his health began to fail in the mid-1970s. He was passionate about fast cars and was personally behind the wheel driving to his hunting trips or his Crimean holidays, and his private collection included a Rolls-Royce, two Mercedes and a Cadillac gifted by foreign leaders. Brezhnev also continued to indulge in his passion for the arts, charming the ballerina Maya Plisetskaya and the opera singer Galina Vishnevskaya. In Politburo meetings, Brezhnev rarely spoke first and allowed his fellow leaders to give their views before making the closing speech himself. Brezhnev instituted the practice of collective speech writing to give his comrades the sense that they were involved in the decision-making process. He had been an effective propagandist and preferred to speak simply and directly to the people rather than litter his speeches with Lenin quotes on the grounds that no one would believe he had read Lenin's works anyway. While Brezhnev's emphasis on collective leadership threatened to elevate potential rivals, he kept them in check by appointing his protégés from Dnipro-Petrovsk to keep an eye on them. In December 1965, Brezhnev and Podgorny secured the dismissal of the ambitious Alexander Shelepin, who as deputy premier and chairman of the party and state control committee had hopes of leading the party himself. Despite his dismissal, Shelepin continued to exercise his influence via his friend Vladimir Shemichastny, but in 1966, Brezhnev managed to appoint his protégé, Nikolai Shelikov, as Minister of the Interior to counter Shemichastny's KGB. In 1967, while Shelepin was in hospital, Brezhnev summoned the Politburo and proposed replacing Shemichastny with Yuri Andropov as the head of the secret police. When Shemichastny protested, Brezhnev assured him that he was not being punished and his new role as Deputy Premier of Ukraine was not a demotion. Brezhnev's desire to bring stability and security to party leaders and members was also reflected in his mission to improve the livelihoods of the Soviet people. In 1964, he formulated his plans to create the material and technological foundations of communism and to increase our people's standard of living. Having already helped Khrushchev institute a minimum wage for workers of 40 rubles a month, in the five-year plan introduced in 1966, Brezhnev proposed increasing this to 60 rubles a month, while reducing prices and taxes. In September 1967, the 50th anniversary year of the October Revolution, Brezhnev introduced a package of social reforms which included the increase in the minimum wage, an increase in holiday entitlement from 12 to 15 days, a uniform retirement age of 60 for men and 55 for women, and a five-day working week. Within 10 years, average real wages had increased by 25%, and much of the Soviet population lived more comfortable lives than they did under Stalin or Khrushchev. In addition to improving lives in the cities, Brezhnev was also determined to improve conditions in the countryside. Artificially low prices for food in the cities meant that the farms did not receive enough money to pay collective farmers a sufficient wage, and Brezhnev decided that the central government should pay the farms enough to cover their production costs and pay their workers a decent wage. Recognizing that Soviet farms were far less productive than those in Western Europe or the United States, Brezhnev's priorities were to develop irrigation, increase the adoption of agricultural technology, and encourage the production and use of fertilizers. Droughts in 1971 and 1972 worsened the situation in the countryside, 
forcing the Soviet Union to import 25.4 million tonnes of grain from abroad. A bumper harvest in 1973 created a new problem, as there were not enough trucks to transport all the crops before they spoiled. Brezhnev was even more worried about meat shortages, and was horrified to hear that in the winter of 1968 to 1969, 12 million animals had died. In a blow to his efforts to demonstrate the superiority of the Soviet system, Brezhnev was forced to import animal feed from the United States, buying $750 million worth in 1972 alone. Brezhnev favoured decentralising economic policymaking, and in 1965 he tasked Premier Alexei Kosygin with introducing economic reforms. These reforms weakened Gosplan, the state planning directorate, and made company directors responsible for setting targets, while reintroducing central ministries to coordinate economic policy. As part of the general policy to improve the standard of living, Brezhnev championed the production of consumer industrial products, including household appliances and furniture. This was accompanied by a housing construction campaign to move families from communal apartments to new housing with their own kitchens and bathrooms. By 1980, Brezhnev claimed that 80% of the urban population lived in their own homes, thus further parting with decades of Soviet policy. In a further attempt to inspire Soviet individualism, Brezhnev encouraged the production of cars, and in August 1966, the Soviet Union entered an agreement with Italian manufacturer Fiat to build 600,000 cars a year in the city of Togliati on the Volga renamed after the leader of the Italian Communist Party. In spite of the focus on consumer products, while workers' wages increased, Soviet production was unable to keep up with the demand, leading to shortages in shops. For all of Brezhnev's promises of economic prosperity, while economic growth stood at 5% in the 1960s, by the 1970s it had fallen below 3%, later labelled as the era of stagnation. Unwilling to restrict wage growth to cut demand, and restore the economic balance, Brezhnev attempted to fill the gap with imports from abroad. The Soviet leadership naturally preferred to buy from fellow socialist countries, but were eventually forced to buy from the capitalist West. While Brezhnev and Kosygin worked together on the economy, as head of the party and head of the government, they were faced by growing political rivals. By delegating responsibility for economic affairs to Kosygin, Brezhnev gave himself the opportunity to criticize the Premier when the economy was not performing as well as expected. In a speech to the Central Committee Plenum in December 1969, Brezhnev attacked Kosygin for failures to meet the targets of the five-year plan. He referred to inefficiencies in economic management, giving the example of four cranes imported from East Germany being transported to the far east port of Vladivostok rather than going directly to the Black Sea. Brezhnev was so convinced of the superiority of the Soviet economic system that he blamed Kosygin and his ministers for sabotaging the economy, attacking the implementation of the reforms rather than the reforms themselves. Acknowledging a shortage of labor in the country, Brezhnev pushed for greater efficiency and improved economic management to increase productivity. While rejecting Stalin's methods of control, Brezhnev also believed that the economic productivity challenges were down to party officials not working hard enough to achieve their targets, as Brezhnev had done earlier in his career in Ukraine, Moldavia and Kazakhstan. While he severely reprimanded Kosygin and other individuals he considered responsible for the country's poor economic performance, in accordance with his leadership style, he preferred encouragement to threats. As the shortages worsened in the 1970s and black markets sprang up to enrich corrupt officials, Brezhnev refrained from investigating his subordinates. As his power struggle with Kosygin continued through the 1970s, Brezhnev strengthened his authority in 1971 by expanding Politburo membership from 11 to 15, allowing him to appoint four allies to the supreme decision-making body. In July 1976, after Kosygin suffered a boating accident, resulting in a hospital stay of more than two months, Brezhnev appointed his Dnipro-Petrovsk friend Nikolai Tikhonov as first deputy premier to Kosygin. The premier's health continued to fail, and in October 1980, two months before his death, he submitted his resignation and was replaced by Tikhonov. In the meantime, Brezhnev also worked to push aside Podgorny. 
after Khrushchev's constitutional reform had been set aside following his removal from power in 1964, Brezhnev introduced a new constitution in 1977, based in part on the work he did for Khrushchev. The constitution increased the powers of the head of state, and Brezhnev successfully engineered his election to the post at Podgorny's expense. In the 1977 constitution, Brezhnev announced that the Soviet Union had successfully become a developed socialist society, and the next stage was to build communism, anticipating a greater role for the people. While Brezhnev's rule is associated with the return to Stalinist political repression following a period of relatively liberal rule under Khrushchev, Brezhnev's biographer, Suzanne Schattenberg, claims that fewer people were imprisoned for anti-Soviet activities under Brezhnev than under Khrushchev. Brezhnev left the task of dealing with political dissidents to the KGB under Shemi Chastny and Andropov. In 1966, the show trial of writers Yuli Daniel and Andrei Sinyavsky, who were sentenced to five and seven years in labor camps, led to comparisons to the Stalinist era. In an effort to maintain Soviet prestige abroad, Brezhnev and Andropov preferred to move against dissidents quietly, such as by negotiating dissident writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn's exile to West Germany in 1974. Brezhnev could not understand why writers and academics opposed the Soviet system, and when Andrei Sakharov began to complain about human rights, Brezhnev initially sought to negotiate with him to understand his grievances, and it was only when Sakharov openly sided with the West in 1973 that Brezhnev considered him a political opponent and a traitor to the Soviet cause. While Brezhnev did not allow Sakharov to collect the Nobel Peace Prize he was awarded in 1975, it was not until 1980 that Sakharov was exiled to the closed city of Gorky, now Nizhny Novgorod. Brezhnev's attitude towards dissidents and political opponents was one of indifference and disappointment, rather than anger or outrage, and he continued to reject Stalinist violence though he compromised with hardline Stalinists in the party and encouraged a balanced appraisal of Stalin, which praised him for the country's economic development while continuing to hold him responsible for the Great Terror. As a means of consolidating his rule, Brezhnev developed a cult of the Great Patriotic War, which focused on the sacrifice of over 20 million people rather than on the veneration of Stalin. On the 9th of May, 1965, the 20th anniversary of victory over Nazi Germany, Brezhnev declared Victory Day a public holiday. The same year, the Supreme Soviet awarded the title of Hero City to seven cities, including Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, and Volgograd, formerly Stalingrad. In 1973, two more Hero Cities were added, Kerch and Novorossiysk, where Brezhnev had served, further indicating his desire to enhance his own personality cult. In 1967, a memorial complex was built at the foot of the Kremlin Wall, including the tomb of the unknown soldier, protected by an eternal flame, alongside marble blocks with the names of the hero cities. That same year, Brezhnev inaugurated the monumental The Motherland Calls statue in Volgograd, which had been commissioned by Khrushchev. As General Secretary of the Communist Party, Brezhnev had no formal role in foreign policy, which was the responsibility of Podgorny, Kosygin, and Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko. Brezhnev did have a role in relations with the leaders of fellow communist states, including Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, and other members of the Warsaw Pact Alliance of Communist States. In December 1967, when invited to intervene in the leadership crisis facing the Czechoslovak Communist Party, Brezhnev supported the young and dynamic Alexander Dubček, over the unpopular incumbent Antonin Novotny. When Dubček introduced reforms to liberalize the party's economic and political control in the Prague Spring, the more hardline members of the Warsaw Pact were afraid that they would be facing similar demands for reform. Brezhnev initially allowed Dubček a free hand, but by the beginning of May, the general secretary began to lose faith in Dubček's ability to hold the party together. The Politburo was afraid that Dubček was seeking to abolish communism altogether, and after failed negotiations at the end of July, the tanks of the Warsaw Pact rolled into Prague on the 21st of August. Dubček and several other reformers were taken to Moscow, where Brezhnev forced them to sign a document reversing the reforms. The Czechoslovak leader returned to Prague on the 27th of August, but was removed from power the following April. 
The intervention in Prague was followed by a statement from Brezhnev that the Soviet Union was prepared to defend socialist rule in the Eastern Bloc, known in the West as the Brezhnev Doctrine. Like his predecessor Khrushchev, who was scarred by the experience of the Second World War, Brezhnev supported a policy of détente, seeking a peaceful relationship with the West. Brezhnev sought to establish direct channels of communication with Western leaders, both to go around the foreign ministry under the hardline Gromyko and to present himself as a pragmatic European statesman rather than a communist ideologue. In 1970, Brezhnev set up a channel with West German Chancellor Willy Brandt, winning his trust by informing him about internal rivalries in the Politburo. On the 12th of August 1970, Brezhnev invited Brandt to the Soviet capital to sign the Treaty of Moscow, which recognized the borders of the two Germanys. While Gromyko and Kosygin signed the document on behalf of the Soviet Union, Brezhnev was present for the ceremony. The occasion allowed Brezhnev and Brandt to meet for the first time, and the two men became close friends. And in 1971, Brandt would join Brezhnev on his holiday in the Crimea. Brezhnev closely followed Brandt's struggle to ratify the treaty, which passed by one vote in 1972. Brezhnev was also keen on seeking a closer diplomatic relationship with France, and in October 1970, French President Georges Pompidou visited the Soviet Union for talks, and the two leaders agreed to have an open dialogue. In 1971, Brezhnev paid a return visit to France, where he admitted to Pompidou that the Soviet economy was struggling and proposed closer trade relations. In addition to Brandt and Pompidou, Brezhnev's ultimate aim was to open a dialogue with President Richard Nixon of the United States. After a border conflict between the Soviet Union and China along the Asuri River in 1969, Nixon sought to take advantage of the Sino-Soviet split by initiating talks with both countries. And after his visit to China in February 1972, Nixon went to Moscow in May. Brezhnev and Nixon agreed to put aside their ideological differences, and the General Secretary reminded the President of the wartime cooperation between Stalin and President Roosevelt. The Soviets and the Americans had begun the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, SALT, in 1969, and following the end of the first round of talks, Brezhnev and Nixon signed the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. In 1973, Nixon invited Brezhnev to the United States, and while at Camp David, the president presented the Soviet leader with a Lincoln Continental. While Nixon sat in the passenger seat, Brezhnev drove down a steep slope at 50 miles an hour, approaching a sharp turn, ignoring Nixon's protests to slow down, before slamming the brakes and making the turn. Brezhnev hoped that demonstrations like these would persuade Western political leaders that he was just like them, but the Americans considered such behavior unstatesmanlike. In 1974, the three men with whom Brezhnev had built personal relationships all departed from the political scene. At the beginning of April, Pompidou died unexpectedly, and at the beginning of May, Brandt was forced to resign after an aide was exposed as an East German spy. In the United States, Nixon was fighting for his political life in the midst of the Watergate scandal. Brezhnev offered his American counterpart moral support and hoped he would stay on, but Nixon eventually resigned from the presidency on the 8th of August. The stress resulting from the unraveling of his foreign policy caused Brezhnev to become addicted to sleeping pills, and from late 1974, his health began to collapse. As a result of his tendency to be late for meetings after falling asleep for several hours, Brezhnev's meetings with foreign leaders were now attended by Gromyko and Konstantin Chernenko, fatally undermining his personal diplomacy approach. Brezhnev nevertheless managed to bring together the leaders of 33 European states and the United States and Canada to agree the Helsinki Accords on the 1st of August 1975, whose provisions included the territorial integrity of European states, a commitment to refrain from military force, economic cooperation between signatories, an acknowledgement of human rights, and the creation of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe to promote peace, mutual support, and respect. However, relations between the United States and the Soviet Union worsened after the election of Jimmy Carter as president. The idealistic Carter's insistence that the Soviets act on their Helsinki commitments and improve their record on human rights irritated Brezhnev who had agreed with Carter's predecessors to set ideology aside. Despite their disagreements and Brezhnev's failing health, 
A further arms reduction treaty was signed by Carter and Brezhnev in Vienna in June 1979, but the agreement was not ratified by either side. In light of Brezhnev's illness, by the late 1970s, Soviet foreign policy was in the hands of KGB chief Andropov, Premier Kosygin, and Defense Minister Dmitry Ustinov. In April 1978, the Socialist People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, under Nur Mohammed Taraki, seized power in a violent coup. Brezhnev and the Politburo had enjoyed cordial relationships with the previous Afghan government and refused calls for aid from Taraki when faced with the outbreak of internal rebellion in March 1979. In September, Foreign Minister Hafizullah Amin overthrew Taraki and it was only after the former initiated contact with the United States that the Politburo authorized an invasion which began on the 25th of December. Brezhnev hoped that the intervention would be over in a few days, but the Soviets were unable to pacify the country and withdrew nine years later. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan fatally undermined Brezhnev's detente policy, and the West's boycott of the 1980 Moscow Olympics dealt a significant blow to Soviet prestige. In order to prevent another Afghan quagmire, when the Polish communist leadership in Warsaw requested Soviet intervention to crush Lech Walesa's democratic solidarity movement, the Politburo ruled out military force. Despite his ill health, Brezhnev played an active role in the Polish crisis in 1980 and 1981, as he urged Polish leaders Stanislaw Kania and General Wojciech Jaruzelski not to offer further concessions to solidarity. In December 1981, after securing a promise from Brezhnev to provide generous economic support, Jaruzelski declared martial law and banned solidarity. The image of the sick and frail Brezhnev after 1975, surrounded by his aging Politburo, mirrored the Soviet Union's economic decline and the failure of détente. Brezhnev's fondness for medals and his frequent absences due to ill health gave rise to the joke that he was having chest expansion surgery. He was awarded the highest accolade of Hero of the Soviet Union four times, on his 60th, 70th, 72nd, and 75th birthdays. In 1973, he was given the Lenin Peace Prize for his diplomacy with France, Germany, and the United States. For his 70th birthday in 1976, he was awarded the rank of Marshal of the Soviet Union, following which he received the majority of his military medals, as party propagandists made him appear more influential than he was during the Second World War. Brezhnev's glorification in propaganda stood in stark contrast to his physical frailty, and attempts by Politburo colleagues to encourage Brezhnev to look after his health and get rid of the pills met with limited success. Brezhnev's poor health obliged the Politburo to look around for a successor, but the likely candidates were in poor health themselves. In 1978, the relatively young Fyodor Kulikov died at the age of 60, leading to his replacement by his 47-year-old protégé, Mikhail Gorbachev, the man who would ultimately lead the Soviet Union to its collapse. By 1982, the leading candidates were the 71-year-old Konstantin Chernenko and the 68-year-old Yuri Andropov, whom Brezhnev appointed his second secretary in May. On the 7th of November, Brezhnev attended the Red Square Parade on the 65th anniversary of the October Revolution. Three days later, Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev died from a heart attack in the early hours of the 10th of November, at the age of 75. After his death was announced on the 12th of November, Yuri Andropov assumed office as General Secretary. On the 15th, Brezhnev was buried at the Kremlin Wall Necropolis, near Lenin's mausoleum. Leonid Brezhnev's 18-year rule as leader of the Soviet Union is usually associated with political and economic stagnation, presided over by a group of old, decrepit and senile men. Yet for most of his life, Brezhnev was a charismatic and dynamic figure who enjoyed football, drove fast cars and had a passion for acting. Like his predecessor and patron Khrushchev, Brezhnev was not a particularly enthusiastic communist and joined the party to advance his career. During the collectivization campaign and Stalin's purges in the 1920s and 1930s, he carried out his instructions from Moscow to ensure his own survival. As he rose through the party ranks, he rejected Stalin's violent methods and preferred to exercise leadership by encouragement and persuasion. Brezhnev's experience of the Second World War reflected that of the Soviet army, 
as it turned the tide of defeat to victory, joining the 18th Army as it reconquered Ukraine and liberated Czechoslovakia. While he enjoyed Khrushchev's patronage in Ukraine, Brezhnev built up his own network in Dnipropetrovsk, where he helped to rebuild Ukrainian industry after the war, before moving to Moldavia. After Khrushchev came to power, Brezhnev began to implement the Virgin Lands program in Kazakhstan, before returning to Moscow in 1956 as Khrushchev's right-hand man, defending him from his enemies in 1957, supervising the Soviet space program and representing the Soviet Union abroad as head of state. After overthrowing Khrushchev and assuming the party leadership in 1964, Brezhnev maintained his power by promising stability and continuity in the Politburo, gradually promoting his allies to keep an eye on potential rivals. He promised the Soviet people higher living standards, but while wages increased, the Soviet economy was unable to supply the necessary agricultural and consumer products required, forcing Brezhnev to turn to foreign imports. In both his economic management and his attitude towards political dissidents, Brezhnev struggled to understand why the Soviet system was not working and continued to believe that it was a question of motivating his fellow comrades to do better. In the realm of foreign policy, during the early 1970s, Brezhnev was successful in building special channels to Western leaders, but political changes in the West and his own failing health undermined his personal diplomacy and reintroduced an atmosphere of mistrust. By the end of his life, relations with the West had deteriorated once again, following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and the Soviet Union itself would only survive for another decade. What do you think of Leonid Brezhnev? Was he an unimaginative communist ideologue, who presided over an era of economic stagnation and decline? Or did he lead the country through a rare era of political stability, during which arrest and deportation was the exception rather than the rule? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.